guys doing? Chris Bedwer here. Today I want to talk to you guys about building speed on the guitar. Uh, wow, that's always the big one amongst a lot of guitar players is how do I get faster? How do I get quicker on the guitar? Um, first of all, I just want to say that uh, if you want to build speed on a guitar, don't make that something that you feel bad about. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of people out there who go you know, building speed is a waste of time, it's not musical, it's, there's no soul, there's no feeling. That, that's just silly nonsense, honestly. It's about how you use it. It's about how you use it. So, before I get into the physicalities of building speed, the things that you do, because it's not really a lesson, this is more like advice and tips and things that I've done, and I want to just share what I've done and, you know, the things I find, and, you know, honestly, I'm still building speed, I'm still trying to get a little bit faster, a little bit smoother, a little bit more accurate. There are things about things that I do that I, I don't really like just yet, but I'm still still trying, I'm still going for it. Um, so before I get into the physicalities of it, I want to talk about, you know, the mental aspect of it, the oops, the abstract parts of it, I guess you could say, the zen-like things of it. Um, so if that's something you don't want to watch, I suggest you either just skip ahead or just find another video, I, I don't know what to tell you. but Honestly, I think that's extremely important. So let's let's talk about that first thing. Okay, so one of the biggest things about uh, jumping into this is your mental state, how you approach this. Because if you approach this with the feeling of I'll never be able to accomplish this, it's gonna it's gonna take forever, it's gonna take too long, that sort of thing. You've already, you've already defeated yourself, and, that, and that's the, the biggest thing, is that you need to adapt what's called a growth mindset. Have the belief that no matter what you do in life, not just guitar playing, but no matter what task is presented to you, that you can accomplish it if given enough time. So the biggest thing with building speed is that it's not this overnight sensation. You're not going to do this in a night. You're not going to do this in two weeks. You're not going to do this in a month. It takes a long time to build speed. Um, I should actually correct that. It doesn't take as long as you would think it takes, but it takes a long time for it to become part of your playing, to become second nature, to become this thing you don't think about anymore. And I'm actually still in that that state myself where sometimes I, I do think about, oh, when, I'm, when my playing get, becomes this conscious effort, and you don't want that. You want it to be an unconscious effort. I mean, it's for me, it's getting better and it's getting easier, but it takes a long, like a long time to get uh, things just in, in the subconscious area of your mind. I think it's very important to to have heroes as well. Some someone or just maybe a few people, because you know we're guitar players. We like to see lots of different guitar players, but having heroes in some form is extremely important and it sounds like well that's obvious have heroes well I've run into students who go I, I don't really have a hero I don't know who to listen to who to look up to which is which was quite strange to me but you know you got you got to have heroes because if you're trying to, to play a certain way with, with speed whether you're going into like the jazz thing or the shred sort of thing or, or what have you it doesn't matter it, you got to have someone you can look at and go, one day, I'm going to be like that. I'm going to play like that. Don't look at your heroes and go, well, geez, forget it now. I'm just going to toss the guitar. I can't do it. Don't do not do that. You got to, like I said, growth mindset. You got to look at them and go, all right. So now that I've, I've talked about uh, the mental state that you need to have, you know, match a school bus after school special sort of believe in yourself and have patience with yourself sort of thing. I do want to talk about the physical aspects of building speed. Tips and advice that I think is pretty good in a general sense and things that I, I kind of follow myself. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is your pick. pick. Um, now I'm not going to be talking about the material of the pick because uh, that's your own personal choice. There's, there's so many different picks out there that with different material. I want to talk about the thickness of the pick, though. I think that's a bit more important. I, I think you might want to think about looking at a, a pick that's thicker. Ones that are like 
0.88 millimeters, 0.60 millimeters. Not, I'm not saying what I'm saying is the be all end all of anything, but I, I don't think it's a good idea to have a, a pick that, in other words, flexes. This pick doesn't flex. I'm not going to try to flex it. I'm going to snap my pick. But <laughs> a pick that flexes can cause like a desynchronization between your left and right hand, and that's that's really a, a problem. Uh, you know, if you're at first it might not seem like a big deal, but as you go faster and faster and faster, the flexing of the pick flopping against the string. If this is the, no, do it like this. If this is a string, and this is your pick, you don't want the pick doing this and snapping down to the next thing because, well, you'll be already on to the next idea or line, and your pick is doing this and snapping down. It's going to cause a desynchronization. I think a thicker pick is a is a better idea. Um, you don't want it to flex. So like I said, the material, that's you, that's your personal choice. I mean, that's more about tonality. Not that thickness doesn't affect tonality, but uh, the material probably affects that a bit more drastically. So the other thing that we want to look at besides uh, the thickness of the pick is your picking angle. So that's, that's something to take into consideration because uh, some people adopt the more flat picking approach, others like to angle the pick. Uh, you might find yourself switching between that depending on what you're playing. Um, I never, let me really kind of take a look at what I'm doing. I'm sorry if I can't really get the camera. Uh, I think for me, I do, I do slightly slant the pick. But the other thing that I also take into consideration with the way I do this is that the angle of my guitar, the classical uh, way of going about things. So, so for me, uh, I do take that a bit more into consideration because the angle of my guitar is already like this, as opposed to the other approach where you're, you're sitting like that. Um, I think I definitely angle a bit more when I, if I play like that. Get that in the camera. If I play like this. So that's something to take into, uh, into consideration. If your strings are already kind of angled up, you might not need to angle as much as you would if you're, if you're playing the other way. So many times with my right hand, I just couldn't seem to glide through. And then I look at it and it's, I'm, I'm picking a little, too, it's a little too flat. So pick angle is definitely a good idea to take a look at. Anchoring versus not anchoring versus closed fist approach, if you don't know what any of that means. Uh, anchoring is when your, well, your pinky or maybe three of your fingers, doesn't really matter, is pretty much like this, and as you're playing, you're, you're kind of super glued to the guitar body. I don't think that's a good idea either. Um, be, the reason being is that uh, if you're anchored, it, it can slow you down as you get faster and faster and faster. And I also find because uh, I'm if I were to anchor, I used to do anchoring actually, I, I find that uh, usually it's my pinky that hangs uh, against the guitar body and I find that there's tons of tension from my pinky going up into my forearm if I, if I, if I do this. So anchoring, I'm, I'm not for it at all. People like to do is they don't anchor but they still have like their fingers flailing. Ah. It's weird for me to play like that. Uh, yeah, they have their fingers uh, flailing. I, I have no issue with this. No issue at all with this. I do tend to play more with uh, a loosely closed fist. Uh, when I hear closed fist, in my head I think like that, you know, like uh, super strong guy. Uh, I tend to do it loose because I also like to uh, hybrid pick. So I have, my, I have my hand loose so I can do that stuff. So that's that's something you want to think about. I, I I would recommend the loose closed fist. People always ask. I get this asked by students. I get this asked by people on Facebook. Sometimes they ask me this stuff too. Um, they ask me, in order to play fast, I hear I have to play slow, um, and then the speed will just come. The answer to that question is yes and no. Yes in the sense that if you practice something slowly, uh, I don't care what it is, it can be just... Yeah, 
you could just practice something. I don't know what I'm playing, but you could practice something like that um, slowly, and then you can try to play it fast, whatever that means to you. And you might find, yeah, you can you can nail it, but you might not find that you can nail it for very long. Be able, you get some speed out of it, definitely, definitely, because speed is a result of accuracy and repetition and proper uh, proper repetition, I should say, you know, perfect practice. Um, but it, it will only go so far. In order to really play fast, you, you have to train yourself to play in fast. You could do with a metronome. You could do as, I actually do recommend mostly working with, with a metronome, but I also recommend working with drum loops or, or backing tracks that might relate to whatever line or scale or idea or arpeggio that you're trying to work on because I think it's good to do all these different things and not have this extreme of a metronome, this extreme of a backing track because you need to know how each one feels uh, working with that. It's a good idea to sit there and train yourself to play fast because honestly any, anytime you, you build speed or you get to the next threshold in, on your metronome you're bumping up the BPMs um, it's always going to be a little bit tense. It's always going to be a little bit tense. You're going to have tension initially. The idea here is that you're trying to get rid of that tension, you're, you're taming the beast, if you will. I mean, when I, when I push my speeds, uh, it takes me a while to get completely relaxed playing these new, faster speeds. And, you know, that, that's, 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 the, that's the big thing. If you're tense, you're not going to be able to play fast for very long. You, you'll slow yourself down in time, and you'll actually just tire yourself out. You can hurt yourself, too. So... You have to you have to train yourself to play faster, and you have to start thinking a little bit faster. I mean, there's go, there's going to come a point where you play something very fast, and you can no longer keep track of that. But there's also a point where if you keep training yourself enough, you will be able to perceive what's going on where you are on the neck, even if you can't exactly get each individual note in your head. I mean, that's a lot of work that you want probably don't want to do. I would suggest, um, and this is something I do all the time, when I'm working on a line or whatever, again, I'll have my metronome going and I'll play through subdivisions. I'll play quarter notes. For a little while, and then I'll play uh, eighth notes. And I'll, I'll loop. I'll loop these ideas, I'll keep looping it over and over again. And then when I feel kind of good about it, I'll try, I'll try 16 notes. Uh, and that's not the line I played initially, but you know, that's that's the same idea. Uh, I'll try 16th notes, um, see how it feels, and I'll, what ends up happening is I'm doing it in bursts, I'm getting more, more used to playing that line a little bit faster, uh, for a little bit longer, and then when I stumble, I'll go back to doing quarter notes and eighth notes, and these are not things that you have to spend like two hours doing. You can do this for a few minutes. You know, it's it's not exactly about the time, how much time you're you're putting in. It's about the quality of that time. So, like like I said before, you want to loop lines. Uh, it's a good idea. I don't really recommend trying to tackle like a big big six string. <laughs> like scale ideas for speed initially, not not initially. I think it's actually a, a better idea to to like just take a scale, maybe a scale fragment and just looping it till it feels good and then like I said working through subdivisions going chord notes, eighth notes, if you want to do triplets do triplets and then try the 16th. I think it's good to loop, have something to loop, can get used to it. And you can just, you can loop it, uh, the top, the top strings, or the, if you, if you have, especially if you have a particular trouble, like, like if you have trouble uh, playing the, the, the bottom strings, some, some people do. Uh, for me, I find that I have trouble playing the, the, the top strings. I don't know, they're, they're thin, I don't know what it is. <laughs> a question that got asked to me too was, is it a good idea to mix techniques? Uh, someone said to me they find that 
often they're playing and then they try and then, and then suddenly they can't help but do like hammer ons, pull offs, or legato ideas with the picking. My answer to that is yes, it's a good idea to mix your techniques, but I also think it's a very good idea to isolate your techniques for a bit and then put them together afterwards. Uh, I have days where I just work on, um, I don't know, say let's legato or something like that. Not very good today, but uh, <laughs> uh, I just work on legato for a little while and, and then I will choose another day where I will mix together my, my picking and my legato and I think it's very important because you don't I've said this in a video before I think one of my lick series where you don't want to do this thing where you have the on switch for picking and turn it off and on switch for legato and then turn it off and on switch for picking and you don't want to do that you want it to be flowing and fluid and yeah it sounds easy as I'm talking about it but it's it's something you definitely have you have to work on. So I would recommend mixing techniques when you can, but also having moments when you need to isolate them, especially if you're having any issues with them. So, like I said, this is not really a lesson. So I have nothing to really teach you directly, like no homework assignment for you or anything like that. But I would definitely say take some of what I said, use what works, whatever doesn't work for you. Put it to the side for now or disregard it. That's up to you. I can't tell you personally how that works. And, you know, just keep working at it. Endure it. No one to take breaks. And I mean, seriously, no one to take breaks because it's good for not only just your, your physical body, but also your mental state. Try to keep relaxed. Train yourself to be relaxed. Don't think that's going to be an overnight thing either. And when I say relaxed, I, I mean your entire body, shoulders, neck all that good stuff. Uh, John Petrucci has an actual, uh, so it's probably floating around YouTube, and one of his lesson DVDs, Ways to Stretch. Um, I'm one of those people I need to stretch before I have a day of playing. I think it's a good idea. I don't have really good blood flow in my wrists and in my uh, extremities, so stretching really helps me. and keeps, It keeps me loose and all that stuff, so stretching might be an idea. So that's all I have for you right now. Um, maybe in the future I will make a whole program on building speed and have lines and tabs and notes. But until then, keep working at it. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Later.